Let us pray. Dear gracious and loving Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for all you've done and all you're going to do. I ask you, Lord, to reach down and touch your word. Move mightily with us, O Lord. Lead, guide, and direct. Show us your will and your way in all things. In Jesus' name I pray, Lord. Amen. Let us turn to Romans chapter 8, starting with the fourth verse. That's Romans chapter 8, starting with the fourth verse. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the Spirit do, uh, do after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But, they, but we are, ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. If Christ be in you, the, uh, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. Now we live in an <clears throat> age where... Most churches teach that you're not only in the flesh, but you'll always be in the flesh. That you, uh, that you can't take and be spiritually minded. That if you do go spiritually minded, you've gone too far. You'll become too spiritually minded to be of any earthly good. As the ministerial committee uh, took and Credentials Committee in Nebraska told me. But the fact is, is you can't be too spiritually minded to be of no earthly good. Because to be spiritually minded requires us to possess the Spirit. Which involves us to be saved and sanctified. Now, they, they talk about why the sinning Christians, which is a oxymoronic statement if there ever was one. Because Christians aren't Christians if they sin. They're sinners. And sinners aren't Christians. <coughs> Unless they think they accept Jesus Christ their personal Savior, then they quit being sinners. The two are polar opposites of each other. One's in the flesh, the other uh, is supposed to be walking in the Spirit. So we take and we find that they are viewing things from the flesh because they're not Christians. And, it, and to walk a holy life requires the Spirit of God to be dwelling in us. Because our carnal nature automatically draws us towards sin. So we need something to take care of that carnal nature, which is the Spirit of God. Let's go to John chapter 4, starting with 23rd verse. That's John chapter 4, starting with the 23rd verse. But the hour cometh and now is when the, worship, uh, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. 
Now this particular passage has taken and been used to justify worshiping in tongues. It's been used to justify taking and removing musical instruments from the church. It's been used to justify a lot of things, but people seem to skip what it's actually saying. We have to be worshiping God in the Spirit, not just through actions, not just through motion. We hear people say, oh, well, what a wonderful worship service we've had today. <coughs> and they're almost always talking about the singing portion of the service. When worship is from the Spirit, and it's supposed to be going on all the time, And if we are saved and sanctified, we will be worshiping God all the time. When is worship? Well, are you conscious? Sound like a good time. It doesn't even require any noise. I know that really annoys most um, people today. But you can worship God silently. You can worship God alone. You can worship God in a crowd. You can worship God with your life. <coughs> but it has to be with your spirit. We can go through the motions of worship all day long and it doesn't mean we're worshiping. It has to be from here. If it's not from within you, it's so much empty action and noise. Let's go to John chapter 16, verse 7. That's John chapter 16, starting with the 7th verse. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. When he is come, he will reprove the world of sin, and of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin, because they believe not on me. On, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear them now. Howbeit he, the, the Spirit of truth, is, howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever th he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show oh, it unto you. So, the Spirit of truth, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit... The very Spirit we ask to be filled with when we come to the Lord and seek sanctification. He is the one that Christ said He would send. And He's the one that reproves the world of sin. He is the one that takes and points out righteousness. He enables righteousness. He gives us the power to live a holy life. So we don't have to live like the world. We don't have to live in the flesh anymore. We can live in the Spirit. That's because of, of the Holy Spirit that we have that power. And He's the one that points out 
But this world is judged already. And the only way to escape it is through Jesus Christ. It says He'll guide us into all truth. Now there's only certain ways we can be guided into truth. We have to be seeking it for one thing. If we're not seeking the truth, how is the Spirit of God going to guide us there? He's not going to go against our free will. So we have to desire truth. We have to be looking into it so that He can take and bring it to us. The Spirit of God moves through the Word. He takes the Word and brings the truth into uh, reality. But we have to be in the Word to receive from the Word. It's like the Bible says that He brings all things to remembrance. You know, it's kind of hard to remember something you've never heard, never seen. It's bad enough for those of us over 50. They say that the average person over 50 loses half their memory by the time they're 50 years old. So we're already batting 50%. <laughs> we need the Spirit bringing all things to remembrance. Because unlike us, his memory never fails. When we ask him the meaning of a word, he doesn't say, well, I used to know, like I did this morning in Sunday school. He actually knows. So it is important that we walk and function through the Spirit of God. Let's go to John chapter 15, starting with the 26th verse. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me, and ye shall bear witness, because ye have been with me from the beginning. So those that know the truth will testify that the Spirit is teaching the truth. <clears throat> but it also means that the, those who know the truth can also spot when it's not the Spirit of God, because it's not speaking the truth. We can spot when the Spirit is taking and saying things that goes against the Word of God rather than with the Word of God. So we can know we're walking in the Spirit of God. Let's go to John chapter 14, starting with the 26th verse. But this Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. So here he's going through stating specifically that the Holy Ghost will teach us all things. I was at a minister's meeting not too many years ago where a person took and looked at a minister took and looked at me and said, You don't honestly believe the church of God has all truth. Yes, I do. We have the spirit of truth. 
And He says He will lead us in, in, and teach us in all things. So if He's teaching us in all things, then yes, we have all truth. So how can we take and go through life at, with partial truth if the Spirit of God is with us and He is all truth? Now, that doesn't mean that we've always understand everything about uh, that He has for us. But He still is there and He has all the truth. So if we're saved and sanctified, we have all the truth. It's just that simple. It's elementary logic, which I know throws a lot of people. People go through the, today, oh, how does it feel? I'll be honest with you, I don't care how it feels. Is it truth? Truth doesn't always feel good. Especially when you're on the wrong side of it. How it feels is immaterial. The question is, am I measuring up to it? Because if it's all true, I'm, it's up to me to conform to it, not for me to conform it to me. It doesn't matter how it feels. We have gotten to a point in our society where everything is, oh, feel this and feel that. They don't use their brain anymore. Feelings are going to come and go. Everybody's got them. But it doesn't mean that they are the tell tell of when it's something is of God what does the word of God say what does the spirit of God direct where it was God in the picture that requires knowledge not feelings let's go on up to verse 16 same chapter And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now, there's a large portion of people, some of which even claim to be Church of God, that teach that we all get it when we get saved. But the Bible's very specific when it comes down to the, uh, to the Holy Ghost. Yes, Christ prayed that we would receive it. So it is something He wants us to have. But it's very specific. The world can't receive it, so we have to be saved before we can receive it. And then it says, He it dwells with you, and we know the disciples were saved, but shall be in you. So that brings home a unique point when Paul asks the, Ephesus, the Ephesians, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? The apostles didn't take and receive the Holy Ghost to the day of Pentecost. They were one in one accord, together, in one place, and praying for ten days. It has been stated, you take and you look at the apostles, they took and prayed for ten days, spoke for ten minutes, and, and thousands got saved. Now we pray for ten minutes, preach for ten days, and almost and nobody gets saved and the difference is where is the spirit of god
People don't receive the Spirit of God because they don't even know to ask for Him. I remember sitting in a camp meeting in Iowa. And yes, they, do ha they used to have those. And I was sitting across the table from this... Yeah, it was Jeanette Flynn, but I wasn't going to mention her name. <laughs> but it's out of the bag now. <laughs> I was sitting there talking to Jeanette Flynn, and, she, and the subject of entire sanctification came up. And she took and said, well, this, uh, they, they used to teach this in the Church of God. And she went through and explained entire sanctification the way the Bible teaches it. And I stopped her and I said, wait a second. In the first place, I understand and know that. But what on earth are you talking about used to teach that? What are you teaching now? And that's when she told me. They weren't teaching being filled with the Spirit of God. They were teaching a ceremonial sanctification, Old Testament style. Where you ceremonially set yourself aside for God's use. But it has nothing to do with cleansing. As the term sanctification is to be cleansed and set aside for a purpose. That's what the word means. And for us to be sanctified, we have to be cleansed of our carnal nature and set aside for the work of God, and then the Holy Spirit can fill us. That's when He does fill us. But if we are not asking the Spirit of God to fill us and to cleanse us of our carnal nature and to take control and let His will be supreme in our lives, we are not walking in the Spirit, we're walking in the flesh. And it doesn't matter how famous the preacher may be. If they are teaching you that you can be sanctified in any way other than the Spirit of God is taking and cleansing you, filling you, and setting you aside for His use, they're teaching you a lie. And if they're teaching that you take... And, well, everybody's set aside for God when we're saved. They're only teaching you a half-truth there. Because we're only partially set aside for God because our own will is in the way. The Spirit of God does dwell with us when we're saved. So he's there telling us the right thing to do. The right way to act. He's there to, to take and be there to empower us when we need it. But he's not inside us. And we don't truly know what power is. There's a reason why when the Scriptures said that they would be, when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, they would become witnesses with power. Because the power comes from the Spirit of God. The only way we can truly know the best way to witness to people is with the Spirit's guidance. Oh, I remember in Bible college when it came to personal evangelism class. They'd go through this long list of things we had to find out about the individual before we would even know where to begin. You have to know their religious background. You have to know how long were they actually in that religion. How regular and how devout were they. So you know where they are to begin to, be, uh, to begin. Fascinating thing is, is the Spirit of God knows exactly where they are and where they've been and how long and what they know. I don't need to to take and trust anything but Him. There's one thing I've found out through the years. 
is there's a lot of people that have spent a lot of years sitting in churches and don't know a thing. It's like they either didn't hear anything or weren't taught anything or both. And it's and the Bible's very clear uh, that the carnal mind can't understand the things of God. So God has to reveal them to us. Well, if he's only now getting to the point to where he can break through our barriers to get us to take him even consider being saved, there's a good chance we don't know anything from what we've been taught. <laughs> And sometimes you're better off that way. I've often said I'd rather take and, and deal with somebody who has no background with God whatsoever when it comes to leading them to the Lord than dealing with somebody who was raised in some church, especially if it was a denominational church. Because they have all this baggage with them. Oh, yes, I know. We can never be good. We can never be righteous. We're going to be evil all our lives. We're, uh, we're in the flesh until we die. That's Babylon. It's not the Word of God. The Bible says when we have the Spirit and when the Spirit dwells in us, we're in the Spirit, not in the flesh. So we can please God. The flesh cannot please God because it's in sin. The Spirit can please God because it comes from God and it's, it's holy. And we're to be holy or else we cannot have it. God will not live in a junk heap. He insists that we come to Him His way and we do things His way. You know, it's a funny thing. Something that really a lot of theologians have a hard time wrapping their minds around. But most kids can. God has the right to set the rules. I know it sounds so simple. But it's amazing how people don't wrap their minds around it. If he is God, he has all power in heaven and earth, he created everything. Nothing's here without his permission. He may not be responsible for everything being here because he lets people sin. But he allows it. So nothing's here that is not here without his knowledge. We didn't sneak anything in. We didn't invent anything new. So he gets to go through and say, okay, as the supreme being that's responsible for creating everything, he gets to say how things are supposed to work. Now, for a lot of years, they've been trying to make robots that can walk like people, make fun of people. Yes, they have robots that will make fun of you. But they had a hard time with certain problems. Namely, walking. It is extremely difficult to walk. I know I'm getting these looks already saying, what do you mean it's extremely difficult to walk? We've been doing it since we were babies. I can see the one young lady out there right now taking, giving me that kind of a look. <laughs> <laughs> but 
it takes a lot to walk because ground isn't even the way we step down on that ground changes every time we do it your body is constantly adjusting the, uh, just so that it doesn't fall down everything has to work together or else you fall on your face and sometimes when everything is working on it all together, you fall on your face. But that takes a lot of calculation. And the result was very simple. It requires more computing power than what most robots have space for. So that they have to do is they have to shortcut the process and not have the robot do everything that, the, that a human can do to walk. Because it's not as good. But guess what? The robot designer still determines what it can do, what it can't do, and how it operates. We're the same way. God determines what we can do, what we can't do, and how we operate. He determines what it takes to make it to heaven and what it takes to live for Him. And He determines the consequences for, for not functioning correctly. If a machine doesn't work the way it's, it's supposed to and won't be repaired, or uh, then it ends up in the junkyard or the scrap heap. It's done away with. Jesus used the term of Gehenna to state what happens to those who will not serve God. Now Gehenna is a place for burning trash. So if we are not serving God, we are trash. So it's very important that we be serving God. And to serve God faithfully requires the Holy Ghost. Without being filled with the Holy Ghost, it is not physically possible to not backslide. Because we need His strength to live a holy life. So it's vitally important to be filled with the Spirit of God. Let's reach out and let the Spirit reign supreme in our lives and walk not only with the Spirit but having Him in us, guiding the way.